Hello, I'm Sean Lim and welcome to After 10. President Bakane has heavily promoted the use of the creative economy to fuel Korea's next stage of growth. On today's After 10, we meet with an intellectual who has practical ideas and concrete steps on how to make this happen. Stay with us. Korea as an IT powerhouse with global leading companies. Korean cultural contents that have seized the world's attention. Traditional cultural heritage with a rich history. In order to successfully promote the creative economy, Korea should make great use of what it already has. This is what Guy Sorman has emphasized. As one of the world's most renowned intellectuals, Sorman has worked as an advisor on cultural policies to the French Prime Minister. He is now working as a cultural critic and columnist for a variety of media. Meet Guy Sorman and hear more about his proposals on successfully promoting Korea's creative economy. Well, Mr. Sorman, thank you so much for joining us tonight on After 10. My pleasure. Well, a lot of people are still trying to figure out the concept of the creative economy that's being promoted <laughs> by President Park Geun-hye. And people are not only trying to figure out the concept, but also trying to put into practical application this uh, new paradigm shift. Uh, you've mentioned that in order to create new things, it's not necessarily a case where you go out and acquire new stuff, but you use what you already have. Can you explain that in a little bit more well, detail? Uh, first of all, any free market economy is creative by definition. Okay? If you are not creative, bringing to the market new products and new services, you are dead. So economy is creative or it's not an economy. Uh, now, in the case of South Korea, uh, my remark was to say that the, uh, Korea has kind of unique cultural resources, you know, a way of looking at the world, and uh, maybe Korea is not using all its cultural resources. For example, uh, you focus mostly on the industry, but practically uh, you have no service economy. Uh, you have wonderful landscapes, you have wonderful museums, uh, you have welcoming people, and so on. How come that you don't have, for example, a tourist economy? Uh, you don't have a convention economy? So I think that the, what South Korea needs is to diversify and not to focus exclusively on the industry. That's one of the arguments I made. And so that certainly incorporates a resource that we already do have and you know, applying that creatively uh, may lead to, I guess, a, another stage of growth. But uh, yeah. you've also emphasized that we should actively uh, look to our historical past in yes. terms of the, the culture and in particular some of the uh, treasures in the Na National Museum of Korea? Well, yeah, you know, uh, one of my surprises when I first came in to Korea, that was nearly 30 years ago, and uh, I thought that I would discover a civilization in halfway between China and Japan. Okay, that's what Europeans usually think. And to my surprise, I discovered that Korea as such was a totally different civilization totally different. And this has been wonderfully expressed by the creation of this National Museum in Seoul. But regretfully enough, I think that you are not proud of your culture. You don't try to export it. You have this museum which is totally unknown. No foreigner ever visit this museum. You don't export the masterpieces that you have in this museum. So it should kind of take a, <clears throat> uh, a lead from the Louvre in Paris? Yeah, of course. And to have like it, a look, higher profile. It is the largest museum in Asia. It is the only museum which is devoted to one civilization. It's totally unique. But <clears throat> I think it goes beyond the museum. The museum revealed that you have a sense of uh, art, of aesthetic, uh, which is not really incorporated in what you produce. So I think you should appeal more to your past, uh, to your sense of beauty, and that you should share that with the rest of the world. So how does 
the world view <laughs> Korea from your perspective as a world traveler and philosopher and intellectual? Uh, things have changed tremendously since, I would say, 30 years. Uh, 30 years ago, when I would say, I'm back from South Korea, where? <laughs> Today, everybody knows where South Korea is. The image has become rather positive. And also, the perception of what South Korea is exporting to the rest of the world has totally changed. Um, you know, in the past, where you were buying a Hyundai car or Samsung telephone, you thought it was Japanese. And today, you know it is South Korean. So there is now a kind of pride which is attached to South Korean products which didn't exist 30 years ago. So it's a, it's a different image. I'm tempted to say it's a different country. The fact that the country has become a democracy also gave a positive reputation to South Korea. This is a, the fact to be a democracy has economic consequences. Well, certainly our leading companies have this new Korea premium image attached to it. But mm -hmm. uh, for the small to medium-sized enterprises, which the government is trying to uh, support, how can they work towards attaching a Korea premium? What separates well, the two? I think that the, 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 the major weakness of the South Korean economy now, it's, it's, it's dominated by a very limited number of groups which are remarkable, uh, which the old world admire. But let's imagine for one second that hundreds of new entrepreneurs were able to get into the market. And if they were able to get into the market through deregulation and through uh, easier access to banking, for example, they would invent things that we don't know about. Probably they would appeal more to their Korean route. They would invent new services, new products, and this is what South Korea needs. So I understand that the program of the new government, but we are waiting for the facts, you know, and it's very nice to talk about deregulation, very nice to talk about small business coming to the market. Let's hope it will happen. Well, you certainly spend time in some of the world's biggest cultural capitals, New York and Paris. Yeah. How do you respond to the recent Korean wave, the Hallyu fever, uh, that has created a cultural status for Seoul? Um, I have a uh, ambiguous feeling. Um, as a Frenchman, uh, I adore, since many, many years, Korean movies and uh, Korean novels and which are not part of the pop culture which is exported by South Korea. But I understand that you need a bit of everything. So South Korean image today is promoted uh, among, let's say, Western intellectual, mostly through cinema and literature. Uh, what you call K-pop uh, is attractive to young, younger generation. I'm not that excited about it, but I understand it's part of a mix and you need a bit of everything uh, to convince that South Korea is different. So how has France and the United States used cultural capital to fuel uh, a, a different paradigm in its economy? Well, it's a we started three centuries ago, <laughs> so you need to catch up, of course. I, mean, they, uh, uh, I think each country has an image, okay? Uh, if you take France, immediately you think quality of life, certain kind of beauty, you know, certain form of happiness. If you think of the, the United States, you think, well, it works. Uh, they are technologically advanced. So South Korea has not yet found its image in a way. We know that South Korea is quite good uh, in technical products, but the image remains a little bit weak. And the alliance between the Korean wave and the Korean products is still in the making, but it's a process which has not yet been achieved. Who drives the national image? Is it the government or is it private industry? Arti or artists. Artists, so oh, we have course. to support I mean, artists. I mean, I mean, that's, 
I keep repeating that to, to different uh, yeah, Korean government. You need to support artists because after all, I mean, why has France a positive image in terms of quality of life? It's because in the 18th century, the king was clever enough to support the painters and the writers and the musicians. So what you need is to support the artists because the artists are the people who create Korean culture. It is the case since more than 2,000 years. And uh, the, 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 this is very, should be easier to understand. I'm not sure it's perfectly understood yet. And you know, the artist has a big advantage. They're rather cheap. You know, to support an artist doesn't cost a lot of money. <laughs> And speaking of artists, I understand the first Korean that you met was a prominent figure in the art world. Yeah, it was Park Nam Joon, absolutely. I met him in New York, actually, and then in Paris. I knew nothing about South Korea. Suddenly, I met this artist, and he was extremely famous uh, in the United States in Europe. He had a rather bad reputation in South Korea because he was too modern and he was kind of a leftist at that time. Uh, but suddenly uh, he invented a new art, which is video art, okay, which is now widely recognized. Now he has a museum in Korea. But at that time, he helped me understand that uh, Korea was a different culture and that uh, Korea was not China, was not Japan. It was totally unique and that he was using this modern media, actually he was using all television sets which were given to him, I don't know by which Korean company, and he was creating a new art which was like nothing else, but deeply rooted in a civilization which I never heard about, which was the Korean civilization. Uh, I used to say to the uh, Korean government, you know, you have a great ambassador abroad, His name is Park Nam Joon. Say who? <laughs> well, and his art wasn't necessarily made immediately for a commercial purpose. So you you actually advocate the support of art for pure art. Yeah, art for pure art because they create new shapes and new style, and and then it becomes popular. And then it, like it irrigates, you know, it irrigates fashion, designs, furnitures, you know, the, the shape of everything. So it starts from a very narrow core, but the artists define, you know, define the fundamentals. And from the fundamental, then it irrigates the whole society. So as you mentioned, the king in the 18th century uh, in France uh, was able to support the artists through just a top-down approach because he was the king. But yeah. in this modern, uh, you know, South Korean democracy, how do you so do uh, do that function? How do you support the artists and convince people who may not be convinced that that's the way to drive a creative economy? Look, uh, you go around Seoul and you are struck by the number of galleries, uh, avant-garde small theaters, uh, small musician groups. You don't know uh, which of these artists, which of these group will be the group of the future but you need to help all of them, and probably one of, one of them will represent South Korea in the future. And once again, it doesn't require a lot of money. It doesn't necessarily require public money. It can be funded by private foundation. You have a lot of very nice museum and galleries which are supported by large uh, South Korean corporates, and I think this is good. You also mentioned that international students can be ambassadors for Korea. How does yeah, that work yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it should work both ways, actually. I mean, the uh, uh, South Korean students now in the United States, mostly, I mean, the, I think they come second after the Chinese and must be for the Japanese, uh, which become more and more parochial. And, uh, but these South Korean students, they tend to remain between themselves and they don't share with the rest of the Americans their culture. They are not maybe proud enough of their culture or they think that their culture is too exotic. So I think they should be encouraged to share. Uh, more generally, um, the uh, South Korean government is supporting a uh, cultural center everywhere in the world. I tell you the truth, there is one in Paris. I don't know where it is. I've never been there, I've never been invited there. So maybe there is some effort to do in favor of this uh, cultural center, but it should work the other way around as well. 
Um, I think uh, yeah, the uh, universities here in South Korea should be more globalized, as we say. I think uh, they should invite more foreign professors, more foreign students. Uh, maybe part of the education should be in English so that you'll be able to attract foreign students. I think that the globalization of higher education in South Korea is a must. Yi Sormon recently visited Korea to publicize his new book. From increasing the social participation of women to expanding the sharing culture, Yi Sormon has shown a high interest in Korea's social issues and he still has more suggestions to make for Korean society. So you say that we should have a more open global environment here, but you also mentioned that there's a need to have a selective immigration policy. Yeah, well, immigration will become your problem and a very significant problem. Why? For, for two reasons. First, uh, the Korean population is becoming older and older. So you have more retired people uh, compared to a dwindling force of working people. And second, uh, the number of women uh, who are employed uh, in the Korean workforce is too limited. So um, the choice is either to bring the women into the workforce, which means that you have to create kindergarten and system you know, to allow the women to go back to the workforce and not to be prisoner at home keeping their children or their child, because usually they have only one. Uh, but this will take time. And uh, this will go against the tradition in a way, and it's not that easy. And also simultaneously, you will need, and it's already the case, to bring foreign workers immigration. You already do it, but you do it um, nearly uh, without any conscience of what you do. And suddenly you will discover that the popula immigrant population in South Korea is extremely important. And you will, find, you will be uh, confronted to the kind of problem we have in France, where you have people belonging to different culture, living together, and this will be a source of conflict. So there is a middle way. Uh, I give many examples, the best being the Swiss example, where you have a quota system, where the employers decide that they need, let's say, 100,000 workers a year, and that these 100,000 workers a year must be selected based on their qualification and based on their working contract. And at the end of their working contract, they are invited to go back to their home. So uh, you don't have an immigration policy so far. You don't have a real policy to integrate the women into the workforce so far. So this will be a limit on the development of South Korea. Let's talk about Korea-Japan relations. Yeah. Uh, Korea-Japan relations are always a complicated uh, subject, and uh, recently they've gone to a uh, new low. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what do you think is the best way forward? Uh, so my position, which may be theoretical, but not only because I know the Korean people, I know the Japanese people, everybody wants peace. I mean, basically, you know, the Japanese people, if you talk with the people, they know they are responsible for the harm they did to China and to Korea. They know. They don't want war, they want peace, they want peaceful relation with Korea. And so the way is not to expect too much from the leaders, but to multiply the number of contacts uh, between the civil organization. I think that, you know, uh, teachers association from Korea should go to Japan and the other way around. And they, uh, all kind of association should build exchanges. So I, I, I believe it, maybe it's artificial, maybe theoretical, but I think it is not. I do think that a reconciliation is possible at the level of the civil society and that the governments will follow. And the civil society is the main thrust of your new book. Can you yes. tell us about that? Yeah. You have some duty vis-a-vis -vis the society. And the public and good. 
and the public good the public and the good. public good cannot be totally satisfied by the government the government cannot you know intervene into details okay so it's not a democratic government anymore you cannot expect you know the corporate sector to take care of what doesn't bring any profit so there is this huge you know uh, desert, I mean the abandoned space, which will should be given uh, to the non-profit sector, and I think the time is now. The time is now. You know, in South Korea, I mean, it was a poor country. I do understand that all efforts were focused on, you know, creating a modern country, but uh, not everybody has been, you know, uh, profiting. Uh, from this modernization. Many people have been forgotten. You have many victims. I mentioned the older people. And uh, yeah, the only solution to have a better society um, is to improve solidarity. It's true everywhere. It's true in South Korea because we are in South Korea. And this can be done only by the proliferation of NGOs, I mean millions of NGOs, because what we need is more experiments, more initiative, new ideas. You know, you you should bring more people to the mix. You know, so more people should have yeah. the courage to try something. And, yeah, and try. You know, if I want to 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 summarize myself, bring women to the workforce and bring the civil society to solve social problems, like you know, to reduce the number of suicide in South Korea. I mean, there, there is in South Korea an actual social pathology which is translated into suicide. The government cannot find any solution, the corporate also not. But at the local level, at the neighborhood level, you know, at the uh, philanthropic level, maybe we can do something to uh, reduce these social pathologies. And where do you see Korean media, particularly Arirang TV's role in boosting well, the I think economy? Well, uh, I think it's very important. I mean, South Korea is, is a global player. It's a global player, and the, uh, it's a, I won't insist, but it is a success story. Nobody denies it. But uh, I think uh, more is to learn from South Korea. You know, how in 50 years you go from total poverty to a decent way of life, how you go from a, an authoritarian regime to a, a democratic regime. So there are things to learn. And the, uh, as I said before, there is a unique Korean civilization, which is nearly unknown. Sometimes I say it's a it's the best secret in Asia, you know? <laughs> and uh, I think that the role of a um, television network like yours is to, to share. I mean, you, you need to share because people can learn from you. All right, Mr. Sorman, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're welcome. And that does it for After 10. Join us again next time. We'll see you soon. We will continue to do our best to improve our show based on the perspective of our viewers. Always feel free to leave us any comments, great ideas, or suggestions you wish to share with us.